Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Thursday's lesson. Uh, I may I may have been way too ambitious today. I don't know if I'm going to get this all done. We're going to do the best we can. So sit back, relax, and enjoy some modern American history. I'm only going to focus on domestic events. When I return tomorrow, we will focus on foreign policy and foreign affairs. But let the games begin. We are going to continue with our post-Reagan presidencies. So Reagan, even though many people would have loved for him to have run for a third term, was not allowed to because of the 22nd Amendment. So his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, ran in 1988 and defeated the Massachusetts governor, Michael Dukakis, with a pretty uh, convincing 426 to 112 victory. Now, two things that happened prior to this uh, election. Number one, at the convention, George W. Uh, I'm sorry, George Herbert Walker Bush uh, made the statement, "Read my lips, no new taxes," and I'm going to actually show you that right now. My opponent, my opponent won't rule out raising taxes, but I will, and the Congress will push me to raise taxes, and I'll say no, and they'll push, and I'll say no, and they'll push again, and I'll say. To them, read my lips. No new taxes. Okay, so they were pretty pumped up about the no new taxes. I got to make sure the video doesn't play. And bear with me for a second. Sorry, trying to do this without a pen is very difficult. Uh, so he's trying to follow the legacy of Ronald Reagan by saying that he will never raise taxes. Well, he did win, and during his presidency, he did have to raise some taxes, and many people think that is why he had no chance of winning in 1992. Now, the other interesting aspect of this campaign was an ad that the Bush people played about a man, Willie Horton. Now, Willie Horton was in jail in Massachusetts, and he was a part of a weekend furlough program in which uh, prisoners who were on good behavior could go home for the weekend and come back on Monday. Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis, um, what, in fairness, it wasn't his program, but he was governor when it happened. And here is an ad that was played before the election. Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. And as you can imagine, this was a very powerful ad. Uh, some people thought it was a key reason why Bush won. Other people thought that they were using race, uh, but we can talk about that later when I get back to class. All right, so Bush is the next president, and number 41, and his vice president was Dan Quayle, and Dan Quayle was quite an interesting character. Uh, he did have a law degree, and he was a very nice man, but he seemed to get in a lot of situations where he said something that kind of made him look a little bit less intelligent than he was. And one of the more famous ones was when he uh, administered a spelling bee. And the word was potato. And here you go. The kid is writing potato on the board. So, the news media had a field day with him not being able to spell potato. But again, in fairness, I do think that the card he was given misspelled the word. Uh, but I guess maybe the vice president should still know how to spell that item. All right. Also under President Bush was the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed. 
And then, this has nothing to do with the Bush administration, but also during this time, terrible race riots took place in Los Angeles after the beating of Rodney King, which was filmed, this is pre-cell phone, so it was rare that somebody happened to have a camera in the woods on the side of the road, but Rodney King was um, driving at about 100 miles an hour. He was under the influence of numerous drugs, and the police were following him, and he had every, they had every right to arrest him. Um, but after they did, four police officers, officers stood over him and beat him for about 90 seconds, and because there was somebody in the area that was filming it, we have a video to show. Now the story that might never have surfaced if someone hadn't picked up his home video camera. We've all seen the pictures of Los Angeles police officers beating a man they had just pulled over. The city's police chief said today he will support criminal charges against some of the men. Here's ABC's Gary Shepard. The three police officers facing felony criminal charges were among a group of 15 who stopped a 25-year-old black man last Saturday night, then beat him, kicked him, and clubbed him, unaware that an amateur photographer was recording the incident on videotape. Los Angeles Police Chief Darrell Gates looked at the tape and said he thinks assault with a deadly weapon will be one of the charges. In our review, we find that uh, the officers... Uh, struck him with batons uh, between 53 and 56 times. Uh, one officer rendered uh, uh, six kicks and one officer one kick. Civil rights organizations say the Los Angeles Police Department has a history of brutality and misconduct that goes back a quarter of a century, including one incident that sparked the Watts riots. So far this year, there have been more than 125 complaints of police misconduct filed with watchdog organizations. We no longer want to have to wake up each morning not knowing what fear to expect next. Today, we are not sure that the police is there to protect us. But Chief Gates today called the LAPD a model department and said he has no plans to resign. Gary Shepard, ABC News, Los Angeles. And after these police officers were put on trial and found not guilty, there were horrific riots that took place in Los Angeles. Incredibly scary, um, uh, with tremendous damage and looting, uh, and people killed, and a truck driver who was pulled from his truck and beaten horrifically. Uh, his name was Reginald Denny. It was a very, very difficult time, uh, similar to those of you that remember the Ferguson riots, I guess, last year. And then the last event for the Bush administration, the appointment of Clarence Thomas, and that is his picture here on the right, Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. Now, I'll teach you later on in the year that the first African-American on the Supreme Court was Thurgood Marshall. And when Thurgood Marshall uh, resigned or retired, President Bush decided to appoint Clarence Thomas. Now, Clarence Thomas does have a very distinguished uh, resume. Uh, nobody really doubted that. But his, I guess, his secretary at the University of Oklahoma, where he worked, came forward and said that uh, uh, he, she accused him of sexual harassment. So during the hearings, it was a basically, it was a, a trial of did Clarence Thomas say these things to her, and therefore should he be on the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm not really comfortable telling you some of the things that uh, she accused him of. Uh, they were a little bit uh, awkward and perverted, but... Um, in the end, the Supreme, uh, the I'm sorry, the Senate did approve him, 52 to 48. It's the closest appointment of any Supreme Court justice in history. And remember, that's 1991 or 92. Clarence Thomas is still on the Supreme Court today. Uh, has a reputation of being quite uh, reticent quite quiet, man of very few words. He is a more conservative member of the court. And 20 years after, after this incident, his wife, his wife um, called Anita Hill, and uh, she may have had a few too many drinks at the time, and was um, uh, recorded bashing her and saying, you owe my husband an apology for all these things that you said to him 20 years ago. And, um, all right, that's it about the Clarence Thomas case. So now we go to 1992, and George Bush did run for re-election, but he's going to lose. He's going to lose to Bill Clinton, Arkansas governor, 370 to 168. 
There was a third party candidate, uh, people my age remember, Ross Perot, a man that uh, had a lot of things to say about the government and tried desperately to break in but could not get any um, couldn't get any uh, electoral votes, as you can see. There is zero next to that. So, what did Bill Clinton do as president? Well, one of the things he instituted was a policy in the military called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which said that you can be gay in the military, but you just can't tell anybody. That policy has since been uh, removed by Barack Obama. I might have told you when we learned about Hillary Clinton about the suicide of Vince Foster. That is when there was these... Um, Investigations about Whitewater, a scandal did back when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas, and whether or not they had made money illegally on a land deal. Uh, the Whitewater scandal is quite confusing. I myself don't even know if I'm fully well-versed in being able to explain it. All right, so we go to Clinton's tax policy, and there you go. That 28% that Reagan fought for, that was he was able to get. Say goodbye to it. Bill Clinton's going to raise it to 39.6%. Uh, NAFTA was the North American Free Trade Agreement. You all seem to know that the other day. That's another Bill Clinton legacy. He did try to reform health care. We are going to learn about health care on Monday, uh, but it did not work. He actually put his wife Hillary in charge of that, and it didn't go too well. Now, two years after Bill Clinton was elected, we have congressional elections, and Bill Clinton is a Democrat, saw so both houses of Congress, the House and the Senate, go Republican. Republicans controlled both. And the new Speaker of the House, this guy down here, I'm pointing in air, nobody can see that, is Newt Gingrich. So now, Bill Clinton is forced to work together. This might be something you're not familiar with in your lifetime, the two sides working with each other to help the nation. Newt Gingrich calls for a contract with America, a very uh, ambitious program, but they did get a lot done, as I think I'll get to in the next slide. The first uh, female attorney general was appointed under Bill Clinton, that's Janet Reno, and they did reform welfare, making it more... I guess uh, the government trying to put more of the power of welfare to the states and really try to reform it so there wasn't enough waste in the program. Now, Bill Clinton will get reelected in 1996. He defeated Robert Dole, 379 to 159. And we have a positive here and we have a negative. The positive is that, remember this Republican Congress and this Democratic president, they work to get a surplus in our budget. First time in 30 years. Now, I want to make sure you all understand this. I know some of you are afraid of the national debt today. I am a little bit as well. The national debt, I think, is 18 or 19 trillion. They're in that range. When Bill Clinton was president, 1998, we actually spent less than we brought in. Now, that's just one year. Please don't say we didn't have a national debt. We did have a debt. It would take many, many years to pay off the debt. But the way you do it is by having a surplus each year. So for the last three years with Clinton, 98, 99, 2000, we did have a budget surplus. So a lot of people point to that as evidence that Bill Clinton did well. Now, the other people will say, in fairness, that Bill Clinton was fortunate. He was president during the dot-com bubble, the Internet age, and therefore the economy was just thriving. I'm trying to give you both sides here. Now, the negative for Clinton is the Monica Lewinsky scandal. He was uh, involved in a terrible incident where he had an affair with an intern. They asked him about it, and under oath, he denied that he had sexual relations with that woman. But then when evidence came forward, um, the evidence appeared um, through testimony, and there was DNA evidence on a blue dress that she had been wearing, this led to an impeachment uh, proceeding. And impeachment is very complicated. Well, it's just a two-part process, so it's actually not complicated. Uh, first, we have the House Representatives. And the House has to vote by a majority to pursue, to continue the impeachment proceeding. So he was impeached, as you can see in the bottom right corner. He was impeached by the House, but sometimes people think impeached means formally removed. It's the Senate that must convict him. And in that body, in that chamber, they needed to get a two-thirds vote, and they weren't able to do so. So Bill Clinton, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, was a terrible tarnish of his reputation. Who knows what it did between he and his wife. 
uh, and the country was embroiled in it for probably a year or two, but he was never removed from office. And then I just put this Elian Gonzalez affair, top right corner. Uh, there was this incident where a, a boy whose mother, um, in 1999, attempted to leave Cuba with, with him, with her son, and get to the United States. But she drowned, and yet, uh, but her son was, uh, I guess, placed with relatives in Florida by the Immigration and Naturalization Service in the United States. So now her fa his father was still back in Cuba. So he's living with relatives in Miami, but his father lives in Cuba. And the debate became, all throughout the country, uh, this really was a huge story. Where should the boy go? Should he stay in the United States? Or should he have to go back to a communist country that we had very bad relations with at the time? Uh, and after, I have to think it was several months, they did go through the um, the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. And the, and the But the court said that only the father can apply for asylum here. And the father wanted him back in Cuba. So the Cuban population in Miami was furious with this situation. It did involve that attorney general I mentioned to you, Janet Reno, and Elian Gonzalez returned back to his home. Uh, he is now, I guess, 21 years old and, or maybe 22, and uh, living with his father, you know, with his father still in Cuba. But as you guys might know, the relations with Cuba have changed since Obama has been president. Okay, so now, now we really get to the big story, and it is the election of 2000. So I would just sit down, hold on to your seats, and wish me luck that I can handle this well. All right, now again, Bill Clinton, two terms, is not allowed to run for a third term. 22nd Amendment restricts that. So we now have George W. Bush, the son of President 41, and we have the Vice President, Al Gore. And this election, again, I have my work cut out for me. So... I taught you that in the Electoral College, you need 270 votes to win. Now, I remember this vividly. Uh, I didn't even go to sleep that night, came to work the next day with about five iced coffees and tried to make it through. So we um, we were watching the election, as, as hopefully you guys will do, in 2016. And news stations, they, they make predictions. News stations, uh, even before the election has been uh, completed, they kind of predict which candidate won each state. And that gets me a little bit upset because you might know that there are time zones in America. So if we're predicting the president at 9 o'clock, well, California, people may not have voted yet. Alaska, people definitely haven't voted yet. And there are other elections going on for local offices. So it's one little frustration of mine that we do this. But anyway, at that night, I'm actually going to fast forward here. Um, you're going to see here that CNN predicted that Al Gore won Florida and therefore was the victor of the 20 or the recipient of the 25 electoral votes. You'll see up here, CBS did the same thing. As a matter of fact, I think they all did. But they, I remember watching that Al Gore won Florida. So when you do the, when you did the math, it really looked like Al Gore was going to be the winner. And then a few minutes later, they said, oh, we're actually going to take that back and say that Bush won Florida. Okay, seems a little odd to us. And then they took that back and said, oh, wait, it's still too close to call. Now, Florida was not the only state that was up for grabs at the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, four other states, New Mexico, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Oregon, the margin of victory was less than point. 5%. This election was so incredibly close. And, and one of those states, Oregon, was also too close to call at the time. But because of the math, it didn't matter who won those states because none of them would have given either Bush or Gore the necessary 270. So it all came down to Florida. Now, why were the events in Florida so contested? There's a lot of reasons. Okay, first we're going to look at this ballot here. I hope you guys can see it. I don't know how well it's going to appear on the map. But there was this butterfly ballot that, this is what it looks like. So if you wanted to vote for George Bush and Dick Cheney, I'm pointing into air again, I don't know why. There, there was an arrow that would go to that circle and you had to punch a hole through that circle. 
If you wanted to vote for Al Gore and his vice president uh, running mate, Joe Lieberman, you'd have to punch a hole where the five says. But if you wanted to vote for Pat Buchanan and Isola Foster on the right side, there was a hole that you have to push to the left. Now, you, I want you all to make a deci decision right now. Is this clear or is it confusing? Because I will tell you that there are many people, elderly people, in Palm Beach County who came out very confused because they wanted to vote for Al Gore, but they actually went across with the line instead of the arrow and voted for Pat Buchanan, but we will never know how many of them did that. Nevertheless, because it was so close and because we had to count absentee ballots and because we had to count ballots from uh, the military and then there were all these accusations that people were denied the right to vote because their name appeared on a registry that said that they were felons, even though it wasn't them. I'm giving you such an abbreviated version, but it was tr tremendously chaotic. So, because it was so close and so controversial, they did a recount. And during the recount, you're not going to believe this, that picture is accurate. People were actually looking at the ballots and deciding, well, does the hole get punched all the way through? Or is the piece of paper, they were calling them hanging chads, maybe that hanging chad doesn't uh, all the way go through, so we shouldn't count it. So now, in 2000 in America, when we think we have the greatest technology, we are hand counting ballots and determining whether or not the paper has been punched through all the way. Yes, this one counts. No, this one doesn't count. Just so you know, I'm very animated while I'm doing this, but you can't see any of it. I have to learn the video component of this. So when they decided after the recount that Bush won, the number was 537. Almost 6 million people voted in Florida, and it came down to 537 votes. And... When people say, well, our vote doesn't count because of the Electoral College, I will always point to this and say there's probably a lot of people in Florida that wish they came out to vote. So even after the Secretary of State Catherine Harris, uh, and her picture is down there in the Daily News article, even though she determined that uh, Bush was the winner, the Gore campaign challenged a decision. And it went through the courts fairly rapidly. Obviously, we were a little bit uh, in need of knowing who the president was going to be. But it did go all the way to the Supreme Court because the Florida Supreme Court ordered recounts of all the Florida counties. So then the Bush campaign appealed. And in this Bush versus Gore Supreme Court case, they basically ended the recount. Um, how they did that is by ruling that the state of Florida's court ordered manual recount of these ballots was unconstitutional. So in essence, they were ending the recount and declaring Bush the winner. And if you really want to know who chose the president, well, since it was a five to four decision, there were four judges, uh, justices who were clearly more conservative and four who were clearly more liberal. The swing vote was going to be Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female on the Supreme Court, and many people today will even say that it was her single vote that declared Bush the winner. This was this was crazy. This was insanity. Now, there's a lot of other things I'd love to say about this election. First, there was another third-party candidate who ran, and his name was Ralph Nader. And I, I didn't do a good job here. I don't have a picture, but Ralph Nader um, took a lot of votes away from Al Gore. And some people think that if he had not run, that Al Gore would have easily won Florida. The other interesting fact is 17,000 people did vote for Patrick Buchanan. And sometimes people think that number alone proves uh, that there was some people who were very confused by the ballot. But I hope I did a decent job. I could go in so much more depth. Please write down any questions you may have. Um, I definitely don't mind answering them when we come back to class when I come back to class on Friday. One thing I hope somebody was a little bit uh, curious about is the total vote, 271 to 266. Uh, do a little math there, because I told you there were 538 electoral votes, and that only adds up to 537. And just for the sake of time, I will tell you why. One lady... Uh, in the Electoral College from Washington, D.C., decided to not award her vote 
to Al Gore. She is a um, unfaithful uh, elector. And the reason why she did that is to bring attention to the fact that Washington, D.C. still does not have a voting member in Congress. So, all right, well, we got to get going here because time is running out. And our well, last one for the today is now President Bush's administration. So, what does President Bush, uh, what is he faced with? Well, we'll start with he makes tax cuts pretty immediate in his presidency. So, he wants to go back to the levels that existed under Ronald Reagan, although he doesn't get it that far. I think he gets it down to 35% as the top bracket. Uh, his No Child Left Behind Act, we've talked about. He tried to get every child by 2000, I think, 12 proficient in English and math. And let's just say that's a little bit unrealistic. Um, this was interesting. He uh, was able to get Congress to pass a prescription drug bill for seniors, for senior citizens. Um, some conservatives didn't like this. They thought it was actually too much government spending. But I do know that the prescription drug pill plan, uh, just prescription drug pill plan, is, that was a mouthful, is far better for seniors today than it was prior to Bush's presidency. Now, we've already learned about the 9-11 attacks, so we're not going to go through that again. We do know that he created the Department of Homeland Security as a result of this. In 2004, Bush did run for re-election and defeated the man you see there, John Kerry, uh, 286 to 251. Um, I mean, this was, for me, this is not that long ago, and I could go on, but I'm not going to say anything about the election. Uh, the worst incident um, in his second term was the hurricane in New Orleans and Mississippi, Hurricane Katrina. I put some pictures down there. The One of the left is people on top of uh, homes asking for help from anybody that can see them. The one on the right is actually the Houston Astrodome, which was set up as a place for people that were in need of shelter at the time. Uh, the debate for Hurricane Katrina, now, now put it in perspective, 2001, we're, we're under attack, and now the country is feeling as if terrorists could hit us at any time. Here we had uh, a weather issue that we, were, we knew about and still couldn't protect our own people. So there was a lot of debate about the role of government and, and how effective we really are. But then I will give you the other side, and that is that maybe this was, should have been more of a state issue. Maybe it was up to Louisiana and Mississippi to do a better job of protecting the citizens. Um, I mean, I was teaching at the time, and I just remember the, in class how people, kids were going back and forth. You know, some kids said, well, why didn't people all leave? But I think we didn't understand that many of these people, you know, if, if they left, they, they were worried that they weren't going to be able to get back for their job the next day. And, and there were people who needed to have a paycheck every day. They were told to go to the Superdome. And then when they went to the Superdome, one of, uh, one of the tiles in the roof actually caved in, collapsed. Um, the levees broke. That's really the big thing, that they supposedly were able to build levees that would keep the water out of the city. And they just failed miserably. So the, the Hurricane Katrina disaster is still with us today. It's been 10 years, and there was a lot of um, coverage in, in August about how well New Orleans is doing today. And for the wealthy people and for the nice areas, it's thriving. But then there are the poor areas that might even be worse today than they were uh, during the storm. Uh, so I can keep going, but I'm going to stop on that. All right, but now... Kids sometimes ask me and say, you know, Mr. Simone, who's the best president in history? And I always want them to clarify what their definition is of best president. And I will say that to me, a president is successful if he achieves what he wanted to do in his agenda, in his platform. By that definition, you have to consider President Bush very successful. He basically achieved everything he wanted except for one thing. He wanted to privatize Social Security. I know some of you brought this up in class. He wanted to give every person an account. Instead of just putting all the Social Security money in one giant government fund like we do today, he wanted each person to be able to manage his or her own account. Now, that is a very conservative view. And as I said to the, I forget who it was in class, um, if you want to do that, that's fine. But now what happens if those accounts that you are managing crash. 
And and that is what happened in 2007. We had a terrible recession. I am not going to go into detail on this right now. But we had a terrible recession in 2007. And it was a financial disaster. And if that privatized Social Security plan had gone through, I just have to be fair, a lot of people would have been suffering even worse because they wouldn't have had their Social Security checks. So, and I don't have a slide here, but I guess I can just make one quickly. That's the best I can do on the fly. So, uh, Obama's victory in 2008, again, Bush was not allowed to run for a third term. Uh, he defeated John McCain 338 to 140. It might seem rather sizable, but again, the way the Electoral College works, it, it very easily could have gone the other way. So why did Obama win? There's many different views on this. Uh, some people think that it was the African-American vote that helped him. Some people think that it was John McCain's decision to select Sarah Palin as his vice president that may have turned people off to that. Regardless of what you say or what you believe is the reason, I will say that John McCain's concession speech uh, was, was truly one of the most inspirational ones I've ever heard. He really um, was a, a class act. And I say this because my sadness is that everything he told us to do, we real as a, as a nation of, of be, trying to unite, I think that the last 15 years, uh, historians will say, has been marked by increased political polarization. Just two sides, regardless of the issue, never working together. This is not a comment on Obama. This is not a comment on Bush. This is a comment on American politics today that these last 15 years have just been possibly the most divisive time. Of course, you know, not the Civil War. That was a little bit worse. Uh, but that's the, the, the point that people try to make about this time. And I will talk to you. We're going to do a whole Obamacare lesson on Monday with Ms. Hayden. So I hope that you were able to follow along on this. Please ask me questions um, in class when I return. And thank you very much. And I will see you on Friday.